CFC, my name is Dennis. I'm one of the pastors here, and we're glad that you're gathered with us as we worship our Lord. I ask uh, to please stand for the call of worship. Hear the word of the Lord as we read Revelation chapter 21, verses 3 through 6 together. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and will be, will be with his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. He will see throne saying, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We are gathered this morning in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, thank you, Pastor Dennis. Please remain standing as we start our time off with um, some song. Light of the world. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days, oh, so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. And I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. And I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. Here I to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me, so here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all 
altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. All the earth. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, breath it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise and pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out praise is your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only
church to Hear the word of the Lord, Psalm chapter 25, verses 4 through 11. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt for it is great. In preparation for our observance of communion, 
We like to take some time to confess our sins individually and corporately. So I'd like to invite you to either kneel or be seated for a moment of silent confession before we come together and confess. And let's pray this prayer together. O oh God, I have no merit. Let Jesus' merit stand for me. I am undeserving, but I look to your tender mercies. I am full of weakness, shortcomings, and sin, but you are full of grace. I confess my deep, frequent, willful sin. I am corrupted body and soul. Help me in everything I do to put down sin and to humble pride. Save me from the love of the world and the pride of life, from everything that is natural to fallen humanity, and let Christ's nature be seen in me day by day. Grant me grace to do your will without complaint and to delight in being separated from sin, that I may know Christ all the more. Amen. Hear the good news of God's forgiveness found in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. To those who look to Jesus for their salvation and redemption, the forgiveness of sins is given in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Praise be to God. Would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, this morning we thank you for this great reminder of what your Son has done for us. As we enter Holy Week, Lord, I pray that we will constantly cast our hearts and our mind back to that week where your son gave his life so sinners like us can be forgiven and redeemed. I pray, Lord, that the confessions that we prayed this morning would be brought before you, that our prayers were earnest and authentic and real, that we came before you in all sincerity, giving you our sins, confessing and turning away, that we can turn towards you, knowing that in your Son we are forgiven, restored, and made clean. I pray this morning as we continue to prepare our hearts and our minds to receive your communion, the communion and the Lord's Supper, that we take it knowing that it is with a grateful heart that we receive what you have given to us. We thank you for your son and all that he has done for us. 
Lord, we ask that you continue to work in us and work in what you and continue to work um, in the people around us as well. May we be a light that shines your gospel to this world. I pray all this in your son's name. Amen. This morning, we have the opportunity to observe communion together. At our church, we baptize, bless you, a baptized, bless you, believer's communion. What that means is if you are a believer but not baptized, I would like to invite you to abstain for today, but please do consider getting baptized. We are uh, offering baptism classes starting today. If you are a believer, there's no reason not to be baptized. If you are not a believer, please abstain and feel free to just observe without shame. This is an opportunity to see the gospel illustrated in God's promise through Christ's body and Christ's blood, his body broken for us and his blood as the co- uh, that seals the new covenant. But if you are a baptized believer, I'd like to invite you at this time to line up to my left or my right. We'll have two of our deacons here ready to serve the elements to you. To bring peace, to be your love, to be nearer to us, you have come. To bring light, to be your light, to shine brighter in us, so we know you. As we partake of the bread and the cup, we receive Christ and all of his benefits. We have our faith nourished and we get a foretaste of the heavenly feast that awaits us. The bread and the cup is also a symbol and representation of the gruesome death of Jesus Christ who was nailed to the cross for the sins of many. And so now we receive this sacrament as a sign and seal of our faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. The Apostle Paul writes this, For I receive from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread with a thankful heart. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take the cup with a thankful heart. Would you pray with me? Oh Jesus, we thank you this morning for the reminder once again of what you have done for us, of how you humbled yourself 
and came down, lived the perfect life that we couldn't live, and died the death that we deserve, so that those of us who put our faith in you can truly be reconciled to God, fully forgiven, made right, and to receive the promise of eternity. We ask this morning, as we humble ourselves before you, that you would speak to us more clearly through your word. Bring us closer to you in this time. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, as we begin to consider the word of God, I would like to teach you a bit of theology again. And catechism is a method and uh, question and answer method of discipleship where I can teach you theology uh, with a Q&A. And so this morning we are talking about, coincidentally, baptism. Question 44 of the New City Catechism asks, what is baptism? And let's all read the answer together. Baptism is the washing with water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It signifies and seals our adoption into Christ, our cleansing from sin, and our commitment to belong to the Lord and to his church. This is a really good answer. I have nothing to add to this. Uh, well, at this time, I would like to invite our kids to go off to Kids for Christ. Thank you, Jonathan and friends, for teaching them today. We have so many today. So good. Well, while they're lining up, why don't the rest of us stand? And let's hear God's word together. This morning, we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 through 25. The Apostle Paul writes this. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets, so that the church may be built up. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you? unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching. If even lifeless instruments such as the flute or the harp do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle give an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So with yourselves. If with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you'll be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks to your spirit, sorry, thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongue more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people, and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus, tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers, while prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers, but for believers. If, therefore, the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues, and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are out of your minds? But if all prophesy, and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all, he is called to account by all, the secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so, falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, every community has its markers. There are ways to show that you belong to a community, that you are really actually a part of the community. Uh, you can think back to high school, where if you wanted to fit into a certain group, 
you had to dress a certain way. You had to talk a certain way. You have to act a certain way. Uh, and it's the same thing, actually, with us. I'll speak specifically to Crossroads, who are not here, so they are the best example to use. Uh, you may wonder why the middle section is so empty, because the college students normally sit there. But it is spring break, and we have a few today. You guys can tell everyone else what I said. So in Crossroads, our college ministry, there are markers. If you want to show that you are a good crossroader, that is to say, uh, a mature Christian, someone who is solid, there are just a few tricks that you have to learn. Number one, you have to, quote, ask good questions. What does that actually mean? No one is quite sure. It may or may not actually have to do anything with the passage that you're looking at, but if it leads to discussion, then that is a good question. Another trick that you can do is, quote, they serve a lot. If you want to win the esteem of any crossroader, all you have to do is give at least two to four hours of your week to serving in some kind of ministry, and they will be convinced that you belong to the group. Uh, there are, of course, markers that would betray you and be like, oh, maybe you're not actually so solid after all. For example, if you were to let a cuss word out, you must not be a Christian at all. See, every community has its markers. There are ways to prove that you belong in the community. And in the church in Corinth, the marker that they specifically wanted, that they loved more than any other proof, was the gift of tongues. The gift of being able to speak in a language that is not your own, in a way that you can communicate with God, in a way that is personal to you and to God, and no one else outside of you knows. That was what they were all about. And Pastor Dennis has been alluding to that, and now it's my privilege to bring this section to a close as we wrap up chapter 14, and uh, Pastor Dennis will bring it to a close next Sunday. Paul has been trying to make the case that real spirituality, real markers of faith, have nothing to do with the gift of tongues. Actually, real spirituality, our main point for today, builds others up. If you want to know that your faith is actually genuine, if you want to know that you are actually a part of the church, not just an attendee, but a member of the body, the marker that we have to look for is that we build others up. And so Paul is bringing his case to a close, and we're going to unpack this in three points. The first is we have to talk about our hearts. We have to look at what we want. And Paul wants to convince the Corinthians to desire the church's growth. What we have to want at bottom is to want the church to grow. Uh, a phenomenon, which is not reflected today, uh, that has been happening recently at our church is that we have been growing significantly. If you ask, for example, uh, one of the ancients here, such as Victor, uh, who have been around for more than five years, he can tell you that our church has grown year over year, several hundred, or several hundred percent, right, Victor? It's grown like crazy. And I remember when I first came here, one of the first conversations I had with Pastor Dennis was to say, hey, I, I love this visible, superficial growth, but what I want to look for is real growth. And what I mean by real growth is, I, honestly, personally, I don't really care about numbers. Dennis and I care about discipleship. The leadership at this church care about not just filling the seats, but growing the people who choose to be a part of our church. And that's what we're going to talk about in our first point. We have to want the church's real spiritual growth. And I'm going to break this apart into a few subpoints. First, in verse 1, we see that we have to let love be the guiding principle. The first step is to let love guide us. You'll see in verse 1 that Paul says that we should pursue love, and Pastor Dennis spoke on this last week in chapter 13. Love is the first and most important proof of genuine faith. Uh, if you want to look, flip back with me, actually, I want to show you something very interesting. Uh, you may be familiar with what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. You'll see how Paul says, if I have all sorts of spiritual gifts, if I have so much faith that I can even move mountains, if I can heal people, it doesn't matter if I don't have love. If I don't love people as Jesus loved them, then that means nothing for my faith. And this is actually not new. Paul is actually echoing what Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 7, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount. You'll remember Jesus said, at the end, there will be people who come to him and they say, Lord, didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we prophesy? And after all that, you would think with all this visible proof of excellent faith, 
Jesus would say, ah, yeah, I knew you all along. Welcome home. But Jesus says, depart from me. I never knew you. And I think that ties into Paul's teaching here, where if you don't have Christian love, if you don't follow Jesus' example, then really no other act of faith really matters. Because real spirituality is not about looking spiritual or doing spiritual things. Real spirituality, ultimately, is showing that your heart has been transformed to be like Christ. It is to become like him, to become like the Son of God who came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. It is that example that we have to imitate. It's that example that we have to aspire to. And so, with the definition that I want to offer today, love seeks the other's highest good. That is the definition we need to keep in mind. Love seeks the other person's highest good, and that means their eternal good. And if we care about each other's eternal good, then necessarily we are going to build each other up. We are going to build each other up. And that was a great transition. We are going to talk about how to build each other up. We have to figure out not every strategy is actually good. Not every approach actually works. And the thing is, uh, people are people. We are all a little quirky in our own little ways. And we each need to be built up in our own ways. And so that involves getting to actually know each other. So let's discern here. Paul wants to lay out two options. You'll remember that the Corinthians were very big on speaking in tongues. And he wants to compare that with prophecy. So with the gift of tongues, verse 2, he says that it's unintelligible. Uh, intelligibility is going to be the big problem here. Uh, to use a more normal word, can you understand it or not? If you can understand it, it's intelligible. If you cannot understand it, it's unintelligible. That is the issue. And in verse 14, Paul himself says, you guys know by experience. You don't even know what you're saying. Like if you're speaking in tongues, you don't even know what's going on. So how can you expect other people to know what's going on? It's unintelligible. It's good for your own faith. In verse 4, Paul says that he builds himself up if he speaks in tongues. I want to suggest that when Paul uses that word there, that's actually a good thing. It means that you are growing your own faith if you speak in tongues. You are gaining some kind of spiritual benefit because you're drawing near to God, you're spending time with him through the Holy Spirit. That is unquestionably a good thing in Paul's mind. But it's only good for yourself. Prophecy, on the other hand, Paul says in verse 3, is good for three things. He says it's good for upbuilding, encouragement, and consolation. So when we think of upbuilding, that means you're growing someone else's faith. You're giving them something to work with that actually deepens their faith with God. It grows their understanding of God. It makes them want to live for God more and more. And encouragement is about supporting that, helping someone along as they try to live out their faith. And when they are struggling to do so, there is consolation. Every one of these examples is about building up the church. And most importantly, every single example is intelligible. Every single example makes sense. It uses the brain. All of these things involve the mind. Now, uh, let me clarify a little bit here. Uh, I will not take a position on whether or not uh, tongues and prophecies and other spiritual gifts are still around. Uh, I don't think our church has an official position on that. We do not have an official position on that, and that's okay. So if you want to practice these gifts, if you follow 1 Corinthians 14, we are very happy with that. But as you can tell with our culture, we are not a church that practices the gifts in this way when we meet together. And so when I have to get to application, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a principle behind this and translate it to us so that it makes sense for our culture, our setting. And I think the application here is, ultimately, we have to ask ourselves again, what do you want? Whose benefit are you seeking? I think what Paul is implying in this, these five verses is that, you, yeah, we should come to church for our own benefit. We should come to church to be nourished and to be fed and to be cared for, but not exclusively for ourselves. Ultimately, when we gather together, we are supposed to be gathering for one another, and we are supposed to be seeking each other's benefit. And this is, uh, 
a common phrase that I hear among uh, our theological ilk, that is to say, relatively theologically conservative, uh, as, a, as an expression of commitment and of a willingness to bear with an imperfect church, they'll say something like, you know, as long as I'm fed, it's okay. You know, as long as the teaching is biblical, it's okay. But I think what happens with that is it's very self-censored. It's just a sanctified consumerism. That's the approach to church. If all I do is come here to be fed, then you've made the church all about yourself. It's only about your benefit. And really, you're just critiquing the pastors who are preaching. And if they're not good enough, you go to the next one and you get fed the meals that you want. I would suggest to you that I come to be fed only is not a healthy perspective on church. Of what it means to be a part of a church. It's just sanctified consumerism. On the contrary, the way that we do things here, we are pulpit-centric. What that means is our worship service is built around preaching. When pa whenever Pastor Dennis or I speak, you'll recognize that we take a bulk of the time here. And we are pulpit-centric because we believe that we will feed you because we want to feed you with the scriptures so that you can benefit others. We equip you so that you can use it for each other's good. That is the purpose of preaching, and really, that is the purpose of gathering together. And so I want to challenge you this morning, if you've been a member of our church or even a regular attendee of our church, I want to challenge you to look for ways to benefit one another, especially in what you say. You'll recognize that the things that Paul says about prophecy here, up -built, like building someone else up, encouraging them, consoling them, you don't need prophecy to do these things. All you need is a little bit of Bible knowledge, the willingness to listen, and the willingness to ask someone, how are you doing in your faith? That is all you need. You see how there is no direct one-to-one -one that needs to be done here. All there is is we are called to build each other up, to encourage, and to console. And we can't do that if we are not having deeper conversations. And so my specific challenge this morning is after service, when we talk together, I would like to encourage you at least talk a little bit about faith. At least talk a little bit about how you're doing. Talk about the sermon. Talk about the confession. Talk about the songs we sang today. Talk about something spiritual. Because if you are not, I would suggest to you that you are not building each other up in the way that we are called to do. Second, we also have to consider how to promote one another's spiritual growth. And you'll remember that I alluded to this earlier. Uh, every person's case by case, and there are going to be ways that work better. And we want to see how Paul unpacks this. And the first thing that he points out is that not all good things are useful. Not all good things are useful. Verses 6 through 12. Again, Paul's metric here is on intelligibility. Does it actually make sense to someone? Does it actually communicate truth to them? That is what Paul wants to refocus their minds on. Because they were so focused on, well, spirituality is if I'm close to God, and if I feel close to him, then I'm spiritual. But Paul wants to shift their way of thinking to say, if you're spiritual, you will care about not just your own soul, but other people's souls. It's actually an intellectual thing. And tongues, by nature, are not intellectual. Tongues, by nature, because they're not intelligible, they are not intellectual. And Paul's going to give two examples. I'm just going to run through them very quickly. The first is verses 7 and 8. He talks about musical instruments. I happen to be a music major. You can trust me on this one. So, uh, you look, anyone can make noise on a musical instrument, right? You think about the second graders that you send to their uh, music classes in elementary school. They give them recorders, and they sound like something. They may not be able to actually play a song, but they, they make sounds. Anyone can do that. So Paul uses a flute and a harp because they're common back then. He uses a bugle for war because that was common back then. But let me suggest that if you don't have the right notes in the right order played in the right way, people won't recognize the song that you're playing. That's the point that Paul is making. If you don't play it correctly in a way that makes sense, people won't know what song you're trying to play. So for example, let me give you a real example. Let's say I just cut out rhythm. I'm going to keep everything in tune, the right notes, but I'm going to cut out rhythm. Ba -dum, 
ta -dum. And you'll be like, that's kind of cute. Don't know what song that is. But if you use the proper rhythm, bum, 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 Beethoven's fifth. Changing something as small as rhythm in music can change the understanding, what you're communicating to someone. Everyone knows Beethoven's fifth, at least the first four notes. But you can communicate because it makes sense. And so Paul is saying, look, in the same way, you guys know that if a bad musician doesn't play the songs correctly, you have no clue what's going on. You can't karaoke to them, you can't dance to them, you can't do anything. In the same way, tongues work the same way. Because you understand it, you can't use it. He uses a second illustration about human language. He says in verse 10, though doubtless there are many human languages and they all have some kind of meaning. But Paul says, if you don't know the language, it won't mean anything to you. And so Paul uses the word foreigner, or ESV translates as foreigner. Uh, it's actually the term in Greek, barbaros, where we get the word barbarian. It's a double entendre. Those are fun, it has two meanings. The first is that a barbarian was just a non-Greek speaker. So they were an outsider culturally, nationally, because they're part of the Roman Empire, etc. They were an outsider. But more than that, the word barbaros is actually an onomatopoeia. An onomatopoeia is, it, it, it sounds like what it is, right? And so the way that works was to a Greek speaker, someone who doesn't speak Greek sounds like bar, 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 and it's a barbaros. It's a barbarian. And so Paul is just saying, look, if I don't understand you, you just sound like bar, 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 bar. Now, you doing tongues in church all together, everyone's just bar, 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 bar. Nothing makes sense. No one's being built up. You may be worshiping well enough, Paul says, but I have no clue what you're doing. I have no clue what you're saying. So what Paul wants to show is that, look, tongues are a good thing. If you are using the gift of tongues to draw closer to God and spend time with him through the Spirit, it's a good thing. But not all good things are useful for building up. And so now, Paul says, you should focus, verse 13 through 19, on the things that are good for building up. Focus on the good things that will build up others. He's calling them to lay down a good thing for a better thing. And in the case of tongues, Paul says in verse 13, look, you can interpret them. And if you can find someone who can interpret the tongues, then go ahead, because then they'll make sense. You can translate it from bar, bar, bar to Greek or bar, bar, bar to English, and so you can understand it, and it's good. It can be improved. Some things can be improved. But what was going on was they were worshiping together. Uh, you know, we call this corporate worship. It means worshiping together. To state the obvious, that's what it is. And that's what it was back then as well. But the thing is, Paul is just simply pointing out, you can't be worshiping together if you don't understand what you're doing, if you don't understand what the other person is saying. You can't really worship together. And so Paul says, if you can't interpret the tongues, it is better to lay it down. It's better to give up the good thing for the better thing. And so Paul says in verses 18 and 19, I, I love this. Paul is so funny. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Whether he's being hyperbolic or not, we don't know. I just think he's kind of funny. Paul says, look, if you're talking about spirituality, I am more spiritual than all of you combined because I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, he says in verse 19, when we gather for church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others in a way that people understand so that I can build them up rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. Paul is saying when he gathers for church, he is there to build others up, not himself. And so the application in this section, I would say, is that we have to learn how to treasure the communication of truth. We have to learn how to treasure the communication of truth. And I've been uh, alluding to this throughout this sermon, but let me say it very clearly here. Paul wants faith to be grown intellectually. Faith is grown intellectually. Faith is actually a rational thing. And what I mean is, look at all the words that Paul's been using about uh, encouraging, even further down, revelation, upbuilding, consolation. He is just talking about speaking truth to someone that will sink into their hearts and change their lives. It's that classic mind, heart, will distinction. You speak in a way that they understand, 
It sinks down to their hearts, and it comes out through their lives. We have to learn to treasure the communication of truth. And I would like to talk a little bit about the way that we do things here. Every component of our worship service is about communicating the truth. Every song that we sing contains scriptural truth. Every prayer that we pray contains spiritual truth. The catechism, the scripture reading, preaching, it's all about the communication of truth. And all of this is just to equip you so that you can be fed and then serve those around you. Everything that we do here is to enter your mind, go down into your heart, and come out in your life for each other's good. And so my encouragement to you is when you gather here, when we have this pulpit-centric worship service, when everything really is about communicating the truth of Scripture, my encouragement to you is to see it. It's to be cognizant of what we are doing. Everything that we do here is to feed you, to equip you, so that your life can be changed, not just for your own good, but for each other's good as well. Lastly, consider how to promote others' salvation. Second point was others' growth. The third is others' salvation. We're getting this from verses 20 through 25. And the first thing that we have to consider with Paul's words is about mature thinking. Again, Paul's focus has been about thinking, uh, rationality, intellect, and one big part of this is actually Paul calls them to grow up intellectually. And mature thinking comes from comprehending Scripture. We find this in verses 20 through 22. See, ironically, the Corinthians thought themselves very spiritual, very mature, because again, for them, spirituality meant I speak in tongues, and I do it a lot. And because I can do that, then I must be spiritual. The irony is, even as they were speaking in tongues and running around feeling all spiritual, they were living in absolute sin. You remember in chapter 5, there was the guy who was sleeping with his stepmom, and the whole church was just celebrating him, talking about how approving and welcoming they are as a community. Uh, people were just puffed up with pride, trying to build themselves up, putting others down. They were so selfish that when they came together to meet as a church, to observe communion, the rich people got drunk and the poor people left hungry. This was a church full of all manner of sin, and they thought themselves spiritual. That's the irony here. So Paul says, don't be children in your thinking. You should be children in evil. That is to say, you should be innocent when it comes to sin, but you should be mature in your thinking. And I want to give you a category here. Uh, sometimes people ask, how can I know that a person is mature as a believer? It's a question that's asked often, especially in Crossroads. And my answer to you, based on this passage, bless you, based on what Paul is saying, is that a mature Christian is someone whose mind is renewed. Right, you'll remember Paul says in Romans 12, 1, that we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. That's when the Spirit uses Scripture and changes the way that we think, and thereby, you'll see this coming, changes your heart, and then changes your life. A person who is a mature believer is someone whose mind, heart, and will are changed, renewed, by Scripture. And so now Paul wants to take them to Scripture. Verse 21 and 22, he wants to quote from Isaiah. In the law it is written, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people, and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Since maturity means thinking about things biblically, Paul wants to say, look, we've been talking about tongues this entire time. Let me tell you from Scripture what the tongues are actually about. And Paul wants to make the point that because of what Isaiah 28, 11 says, tongues are actually meant as a sign for non-believers. But it's explicitly a sign for their disadvantage. And what I mean is, it's a sign of judgment. The way that the Corinthian believers were using tongues, they were just flouting it and being all spiritual, and they were getting all hyped together, and they were thinking, wow, this is such a spiritual gathering. If anyone were to walk into this room, they would think, man, God is among them. But Paul points out with Isaiah, look, you want to know what God himself says about tongues? These are not for their salvation. This 
gifts. This sign specifically is for their judgment. The idea is that God is speaking the truth as they are speaking in tongues. But as Isaiah says, I will speak to them in the language of foreigners, and even then they will not listen to me. They will come to the conclusion that God actually is not real, nor is he among them. It's in that sense that tongues are a sign for unbelievers to their disadvantage. And on the other hand, Paul says, prophecy is a sign for believers, for our advantage. Uh, there is a bit of theology in the Old Testament where if God is judging Judah or God is judging Israel, he takes away prophecy as a sign of judgment, that God is cutting off the line of communication, God is not speaking with them anymore, and so that's why there's no more prophecy. That's a sign of judgment. But if there are prophets among God's people, then that's a sign of favor. That's a sign that God is actually with them to bless them and is working through them. So Paul wants to set their thinking right in all these ways. You'll think about how since chapter 12 until today, Paul has been unpacking this enormous case about tongues, all pointing to this. It is to say they were wrong from the get-go. Tongues were never about spirituality. Tongues were never about being faithful. Tongues were always meant to be a sign to the disadvantage of others. But if that's the case, if it's not going to help a non-believer come to faith, then instead, they should gather in such a way that a non-believer could be saved. And so Paul gives a closing illustration. He's going to use two hyperboles, two exaggerations. He says, if everyone speaks in tongues, and the second one, if everyone prophesies. So he says, first, imagine a church where they only speak in tongues, and a non-believer, an outsider, walks into church, and they just hear, bar, 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 bar. And Paul says, look, all they're going to do is think that you're crazy. And you remember that Paul is actually speaking from church history, from Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit first enters into the church, and he covers the apostles with the tongues of fire, and they all start speaking in tongues. And everyone there just thinks they're crazy or drunk. Paul's speaking from experience. He's saying, look, this is exactly what happened in Acts 2, at the beginning of the church. What makes you think that your community is different? That is what tongues do. All they're going to do is convince people that you're crazy. But the other example, if everyone prophesied, then people will be convicted that God is actually among you. Paul, I want you to focus with me, verse 24. But if all prophesy and an unbeliever outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. The gift of prophecy that Paul is talking about here is not predictive. It's actually incisive. What I mean is that you can cut into someone's heart. With this gift of prophecy, it's not predicting the future. It's cutting into someone's heart and being able to expose what happens in there. And so Paul imagines this situation. He presents this hypothetical situation. He says, imagine if all of you, upon seeing a non-believer, you're filled with the Spirit, and the Spirit leads you to exactly what that person needs to hear to show them why they need Jesus. They will be convinced because they've never met you before, you've never met them before, but you know the secrets of their heart. And so Paul says, they will conclude, God must really be among you. Now, as I said before, we are not a church that generally practices these gifts. But we are a church that preaches the word. We are a church that preaches the word. And the word, as the author of Hebrews says, cuts through the heart. Scripture cuts in a way that it exposes the person as they are listening to it. Without me even identifying a single person, if God is working through the scripture in a person's heart, he will reveal the hidden sins that that person may or may not even be aware of. See, we are not lacking just because we don't practice prophecy here, because we preach the word of God. The word of God is so effective that it can cut through a hardened heart and make it new again. The word of God is so effective that it can convince a person of the sins that they've been hiding all along or the sins that they have known of and been excusing all this time and they are brought 
to account before the holy God because they recognize that someday they will have to stand before God and give an account of their entire lives and they will recognize I may not be the worst person, but I am not good enough to stand before the perfect and holy God. And the word of God tells us that that same God sent his son, fully God and fully man, to live the perfect life that we couldn't live and die the death that we deserved so that if we put our faith in him and submit to him in obedience and repentance, we will not only be forgiven, but accepted and loved and brought home into his kingdom. That is the power of the word of God. Everything that we do here is to make the gospel clear. Uh, There's another thought that has been bouncing around. Uh, A few people, different demographics have talked to me about this, how they feel like uh, it's difficult to bring their church or their their non-Christian friends to this specific church because of the things we do in the worship service. We have confession. We have assurance. We do communion a lot. And it comes off weird to use the gentlest term. I would suggest to you on two different angles that the problem is not as big as you would think. Number one, everything we do is weird. Think about it, why are we, we're all facing that way and singing to nothing. That is weird. Even if you only do communion once a month, it's still weird. Because if you're not a believer, no matter what we do or no matter how we cool it down, it's still not going to be like the world. And because we are not like them, we are going to be weird no matter what. On the other side, I would like to encourage you to see everything we do, all the weird things that we do, not as a problem, but as an opportunity. Think about it like this. If a visitor, a non-believer, steps into our service, they have not just the gospel preached to them, but they have the gospel visibly displayed. As we gather together to confess together, we remind you that we are confessing to a God who loves to forgive, a God who is merciful, who is worthy of our confession. And we are reminding them of the assurance that comes through the cross. When Jesus says that no one will snatch them out of my Father's hand, he means that. And when he says in John 6 that he will never cast anyone out who puts their faith in him, he means that. The assurance that we give, the communion that we observe, everything that we do is another way to shine forth the gospel. And so I would encourage you, please do invite your non-Christian friends. And when you do, take it upon yourself to explain the gospel. And use everything we do as a prop for the gospel, because that's what it is. We don't just say the gospel as rote memorization. We respond to the gospel. We show the gospel together as we worship in a way that hits the mind, goes down to the heart, and God willing, changes lives. So my encouragement for you is, please do invite your non-Christian friends. And please do, when you come, gather for one another. Gather with the intent to be fed and to be equipped so that you can be built up and in turn serve and encourage one another. Because if we do, remember that Jesus said, if we love one another as he loves us, then the world will know that we are his disciples. Let's pray together. Our God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its clarity and its continued significance toward us. We ask that you would continue to grow our hearts in this direction, that our hearts would be for one another and also for our non-believing friends. We ask that you would help each of us to show the gospel clearly, individually in our own lives, in the stewardship you've given us, and also together when we meet. Help us to live in such a way that is worthy of your gospel. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Theo, for the sermon this morning. Please rise as we sing a song in response. Let's sing this together. Worthy. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. 
worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath that you'd ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Let's sing worthy. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. I will build my life. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. And I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation, and I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken and holy. There is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those Let's sing that one more time. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. May I have a seat? As we continue our time of worship, as we continue to see the value and beauty of the gospel, 
having received God's welcome, forgiveness, peace, instruction, and communion, we're to respond by returning a portion of what we have given because he is truly worthy. And as Christians, we are called to give of our finances regularly, sacrificially, and cheerfully to to support the work of the ministry through the local church. Uh, We are thankful for the members and for attendees and those who have been giving very sacrificially so we've seen the gospel continue to be displayed and put forth. You can give through PayPal or through Zelle. And with that information found on our website, vinewoodcfc.com. And you just click on the Give tab for more information there. If you are new to Vinewood, uh, do not feel obligated to give. Uh, we're just very thankful that you are here and joining us this morning. Uh, but we would love to get connected with you. The easiest way is for you to fill out that welcome card that was handed to you this morning as you've entered the church. Or there is a welcome card in the front seat uh, right in front of you. Um, You can just fill that out and simply return it to any of our welcome team members in the back wearing the purple lanyards. Or you can scan that QR code if you want to save a tree and fill out that welcome card via Google form as well. As we close our time together, I'd like to highlight uh, some announcements. We have quite a bit this morning. First one, it is our prayer meeting that takes place at 840 on Sundays. Uh, Next week, due to Easter service, there will be no prayer meeting, but there will be prayer meetings that resume the following week. So we'd love for you to be with us at that time. Um, If Just go up. It's going to be in room 202 if you'd like to attend in person, but please don't come next week because nobody will be here. Uh, Second, we will have a Good Friday service uh, this upcoming Friday as we enter into Holy Week. Good Friday um, is a time that we remember Jesus' death and his crucifixion on the cross. This will take place in the Fellowship Hall on March 29th at 7.30 p.m. Um, all fellowships will be participating in the event from all the way from our youth group called Agape uh, all the way up. There is also a separate children's program that is available as well. So if you have a young one or you know somebody with young ones, uh, don't fear. There is actually an activity and program for them as well. Following the Good Friday service, we will have an Easter Sunday combined worship service with our Chinese congregation this year. Um, To accommodate for the space, because we would not be able to all fit in this room together, Um, praise God, we will be actually worshiping, we're renting out a venue so it could accommodate all of us that Easter Sunday. So pay attention, it's going to be a little bit different because of the changes. First, we have to change the time of of our gathering because we are renting out a church and they will have their own Easter morning service. We'll be meeting at 3 p.m. next week. Second, it's going to be at First Presbyterian Church of Berkeley. It is not too far from here. It's at 2407 Dana Street. It's a little bit closer to campus. You can also Google that and look that up on as well. And um, you can also check our website for information about parking. So just kind of very quick, there is parking. There's, a, uh, I think, a small parking lot on site there. Uh, they do charge uh, for parking um, and I believe it's $2, oh, sorry, $3 an hour. I think they charge by every 20 minutes. And so uh, with a cap of $10, there's also another parking lot uh, nearby that um, charges a minimal fee as well. Or since it is Sunday, it is free parking on the street. So I would like to encourage all of you to uh, come early to secure some parking uh, as we worship together at 3 p.m. Uh, Next is our spring baptism. It will be taking place on April 21st. So especially for those who have been coming here and our believers, who are baptized believers, we'd love for you to join us that Sunday as we celebrate those who will be getting baptized. But if you are not baptized and you are a follower of Jesus and you're interested in getting baptized or maybe you just want to learn what baptism is about, our class starts today at 11 a.m. in room 201. There'll be two classes. They're going to be spaced out accordingly, and it is mandatory for those who would like to get baptized this spring. So if you're interested in that, please uh, attend that class, and you'll get more information. Uh, Deacon Victor will be teaching that class. If you're interested in becoming a member of our church or learning more about what membership is about here, there's also a membership class uh, on April 28th. 
um, in at room 202 at 11.15 a.m. So kind of mark that down if you're interested in joining us for membership. Two more, bear with me. There is Vacation Bible School, uh, and that registration is discounted with a priority enrollment for non CFC Berkeley members until April 14th. It is discounted. So if you are, if you know people, so this is kind of primarily, if you know people who are interested in something like this, maybe you have a neighbor or a friend, we want them to be able to come and join us for that. And on top of that, because we want this to be an outreach and an opportunity for evangelism, we want to give them a discount. And so it will be 50% off, and we want to give them priority. And so whatever spots that are not filled up, we would kind of fill it up with the rest of those who in our church. So we would love for you to use this as an opportunity to share and kind of invite people to our, um, our uh, VBS Vacation Bible School class or uh, curriculum. Um, it is going to be a week-long uh, time together, and so we would like to encourage you. The theme is Breaker Rock Beach, God's Rock Solid Truth in a World of Shifting Sands. And so uh, if you know anyone, please sign up. If you would like to volunteer or help for VBS, um, we, uh, registration kicks off today as well. Visit our website for registering your child or if you want to register to be a volunteer. One more announcement. Finally, we're excited to announce the save the date for our CFC Berkeley 2024 summer retreat. And so retreat will take place Friday, July 5th to Sunday, July 7th at Sonoma State University. Early bird registration kicks off April 14th. And stay tuned for more information about our speaker and our retreat theme. And so please mark that in your calendars. We hope to see all of you there. Uh, for any other announcements, you can find it in our bulletin and our website, vinewoodcfc.com. I cannot remember. I believe I'd like to invite Pastor Theo to give our benediction. Would you stand with me, please? Now receive the benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and always. Amen. You're dismissed. Have a great week. Love you.